This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit shalcedon.edu to download this book in PDF. The One and the Many by R.J. Rushjourney. Copyright 1971-2007, Mark R. Rushjourney. Shalcedon Ross House Books. Chapter 2. The Ground of Liberty. Section 1. Introduction. Liberty has been a recurring factor in history and has repeatedly been a commanding aspect of the human scene, only then to disappear into an order in essence and action radically hostile to it. It is important, therefore, to consider the root and ground of true liberty. Liberty has obviously been repeatedly accidental, as in medieval Muslim culture. It has disappeared with none to regret its passing as the inner logic of a culture has progressively manifested itself and dropped the procedural tensions which, for a season, gave rise to liberty. Liberty is thus comparable to happiness in that it is a result, not to be sought for as a primary end, but rather as the product of true order. And even as a basically unhappy man can have happy moments, so basically anti-libertarian cultures can have periods of liberty without any deviation from their fundamental nature. This point is especially relevant in that current libertarian movements are radically premised on the same grounds as messianic statism, on the Enlightenment and its faith. The history of the West has seen, as Hermann Doyeviert has analysed it, four cultural motives, all based on radically religious premises. These premises are not always recognised, they often function as the unrecognised axioms of thought and are all the more powerful by virtue of the basically religious commitment to them. Moreover, these cultural premises have, as their basis, a philosophical tension. With the exception of the Christian motive, they are all dialectical in nature, which means that they are basically and intrinsically divided by an irrevocable religious and philosophical antithesis two central motive powers, intention and conflict. In such a situation, liberty often arises as a byproduct of dialectical imbalance, as was the case in the 18th and 19th centuries, only to disappear subsequently. As the recognition of the irrevocability of the tension becomes more and more clear, the culture collapses. This philosophical tension, as Cornelius Van Til has shown, between the one and the many, between unity and diversity, universality and particularity. The question which haunts the dialectical culture is this, how to have unity without totally undifferentiated and meaningless oneness? If all things are basically one, then differences are meaningless, divisions false, and definitions are sophistications in that the tyranny or destiny of oneness is the truth of all being. But if all things are basically many, and if plurality is ultimate, then the world dissolves into unrelated particulars and becomes, as some thinkers insist, not a universe, but a multiverse, and every atom is, in a sense, its own law and being. The first leads to the breakdown of differences and the liberty of atomistic individualism and particularity, the second is the breakdown of fundamental law into nihilism and the retreat of men and their arts into isolated and private universes. Our naive experience testifies to the reality of both the one and the many. The history of thought and culture testifies to the continual shattering of cultures on the impossibility of their theoretical, religious, cultural and political reconciliation apart from the premise of consistently biblical thought and faith. Operative in all these other philosophies, all apostate from the Christian perspective, is the presupposed autonomy of theoretical thought, that is, reason playing the role of God, an ultimate judge rather than reason as reason. Section 2. Liberty and Dialectics All this means that, at the very least, two questions are involved in any discussion of liberty. First, what is true liberty? Liberty not as the accident of a culture, but as an aspect and product of its essence. Second, is liberty worthwhile? The second question is an obvious one, but it needs to be recognised. 
liberty is worthwhile only when it has an essential relation to the faith of a culture. A few years ago, Lin Yu Tang called attention to the change in Western culture since Patrick Henry said, Give me liberty or give me death. Those words once electrified men. The only whisper we can hear now is, Give me security or give me death. Put me in a collectivistic jail if you want, but give me a meal ticket and an old age coupon. What a come down for a revolutionist. What an amazing contrast to the hope of man in the 18th century. End quote. The question of liberty is thus, in a very real measure, a question of faith. Man's current problem in the economic realm is not that capitalism has failed them, but that man has failed. As a result, capitalism, liberty and individualism all have an unpleasant and distasteful ring to man. Their very success adds to their offence when man himself is a failure. What is it in Western culture that has produced this recurring revulsion for liberty? Why has it been so widely prevalent again in our day? We have cited its repeated abandonment in dialectical cultures. Let us now examine the cultural motives of a Western civilization in terms of this concern. The antithesis or dialectic of Greek culture came to be, as a, as a result of a long development, the form matter motive. The dif differences between Greek philosophers were differences of emphasis. The common presupposition of all was the form matter motive. Two worlds were thus seen in mixture, but as basically alien to one another. One, the world of nature, of matter, of hard reality and atoms, and the other, the world of form, ideas, universals. The first is given to change and flux, the other is timeless, unchanging and eternal. Reality, the real world, was thus made up, in some fashion, of two antithetical and irreconcilable elements. Naive experience might see this all as one world, but theoretical thought understood it as an irrevocably dialectical existence. Accordingly, as theoretical thought dealt progressively with this problem, it became progressively aware that its dialectics were destroying rather than undergirding human faith and culture. It tended steadily to denigrate or suppress one or another aspect of this dualistic dualistic interpretation of reality. If matter were stressed, then all things were reduced to atoms, all else in reality being dismissed as subjective and illusionary, with consequent cynicism and cultural collapse. If forms or ideas were stressed, then mysticism became man's escape from the false world of appearance or matter. Mysticism is always incapable of dealing with the problems of culture because it is a denial of their validity. The great one must absorb all reality, and individuation is an unhealthy separation. Neoplatonic mysticism permeated the Greco-Roman world, and it quickly infiltrated the church, thinly disguised as Christianity. Thus, Simon St Stylites was under constant disapproval as far as the church was concerned, and his roots were Neoplatonism and the Aetagot. Atargatus cult. The mystical concept of the world, however, has always has as its counterpart the materialistic concept con contempt of law and meaning as subjective, relative, or irrelevant. Thus, the, the cynics who came into prominence in Greece in the 4th century BC and continued to be prominent to the 6th century AD held that hedonism or happiness was the only true goal for life and that the wise man, furthermore, sought to decrease his desires as the wiser means of attaining happiness. Cynicism thus fathered Stoicism. The Cyrenaic school differed in that it sought to increase the satisfactions. The name of both schools was derived from Kion, dog, and the name is revelatory. Since law and with it ethics had been excluded from the hard world of reality as subjective nonsense, the philosophers of this school often deliberately aped dogs in shamelessness, begging, barking and biting, and even copulated in public to express their contempt of any philosophy which would exalt man above his animal reality. Man being an atom in an atomic world, self-sufficiency became his goal, to be independent of any law outside of his own desires 
and to be wholly dependent on his own inner resources for happiness. Thus, Diogenes of Sinope died shortly after 325 BC, who is well known for his pseudo-search for an honest man, demonstrated these doctrines very vividly. He was independent of housing. He held that the sexual urge was totally natural and that to seek privacy in its satisfaction or to be governed by prohibitions, such as that agonist incest, such as that against incest, was unnatural. In our day, Kinsey has classified homosexuality and animal contacts, contacts with marital sex as alike normal because natural outlets. Diogenes saw no reason to prefer one woman to another, or, if a woman were lacking, he prescribed open and public masturbation as a natural and prophylactic measure, stating that he wished all hungers were equally easy to satisfy. Likewise, Diogenes saw no valid objection to cannibalism. Thus, Diogenes was ready to grant extreme license, and yet, by his contempt of anything destructive of atomism, he was at one and the same time given to fantastic ascetic practices to avoid dependence on others. The difference is not great. Both mysticism and asceticism, on the one hand, and materialistic atomism, on the other, involve a denial of an aspect of reality, and run into both a wild emotionalism and a ready castration of the whole man and his life. Thus, on the one hand, wealth and success were religiously reprehensible and dirty, whereas on the other, as much later in the French and Russian revolutions and in Nazi thought, culture was a divisive and ugly thing, a pretension as against the hard world of material, political and economic reality. The reported Nazi sentiment, quote, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver, end quote, epitomises the recurring temper of diseased societies. Modern music, art and literature are at war against culture. The medieval Roman Catholic nature-grace motive retained the dialectical character of Greek thought. The natural world was a realm in itself, knowable by means of autonomous reason, which, while unable to penetrate the mysteries of the supernatural, was still self-sufficient in terms of the natural Grace, thus, neither cancelled nature nor superseded it, but rather perfected it, in terms of scholastic thought. In the natural realm, no authority but reason needed to be acknowledged, although it was assumed that nature would not contradict grace. Indeed, it could not, since two separate worlds were involved. Man dwelt in one world as a perishable and material body, and in the other as an ostensibly rational and immortal soul. Here the Greek form matter motive is seen in the thinly Christianized terminology and form. Again, the same nemesis plagued it. The nominalists simply denied the reality of the universals of the world of grace. The world again relapsed into atomism. If reason was sovereign in its realm, and reason knew nothing of this realm of grace with its law, then reason must conclude that this world of grace and law was not real. And, assuming the reality of the two worlds, what held them together? The result was cynicism and mysticism. Extravagant, mystical and ascetic practices flourished. Various cults gave license to nudism and sexual promiscuity in the name of the new Christianity. Physical degeneration characterised the man of the late Middle Ages, and medieval historians have estimated that, at Luther's coming, one-third to half of Europe was infected by venereal diseases, then far more vir virulent than now. Churchmen themselves, often led by popes, gave expression to both radical cynicism and a frenetic immorality. As in the case of Greco-Roman culture, the decline was not without its skyrocketing byproducts, startling but eventually earthbound manifestations of one facet or another. Thus, the Renaissance was dedicated to a materialistic atomism on the one hand and a revival of Neoplatonism on the other. Both were equally sterile in the long run, and the atomism paved the way for the Renaissance tyrant by its destruction of the concept of fundamental law. Restraint was thus removed. <coughs> Section 3. The Enlightenment The next great cultural motive, having roots in the two previous dialectics and in the humanism of the Renaissance, came to a sharp statement in the Enlightenment. 
the dialectical tension was now between nature and freedom. Man was the ostensible resolution of this dialectic. In Descartes, man became the focal point of these two worlds. Various devices were used to attempt to overcome the handicap of man's previous dialectics. To avoid atomism in the natural order, the state was posited as a body created by social contract between autonomous and atomistic men. To avoid the collapse of the spiritual realm, the realm of freedom or value, the mind was credited with creative power in the religious sense. As Doyavird has pointed out, Hobbes, in the foreword to his De Corpore, declared that the mind should first destroy the given world and then, godlike, recreate it by theoretical thought. For, according to Hobbes, quote, logical thought should create, like God or like the artist. End quote. Because the state was the creation of man, it was believed that in a special sense, whereas by contrast the family was given and the church somewhat external to the natural realm, the state became all the more powerful, real and natural precisely because it was man's creation in the world of nature. Likewise, in the realm of value, man was creating his own contracts, laws and standards and thereby asserting his autonomy. Rootlessness was conceived of as an intellectual virtue in that the denial of the past, of history and of God, was essential to the true sovereignty and creativity of man. In Immanuel Kant, the sovereignty of this autonomous man and his reason came to full focus, and hence to rapid dissolution as the dialectical tension became paramount. For him, the true self of man is identical with the law which man himself creates. Thus, man became truly sovereign, and in Kant's theoretical and practical reason, became the creator of his world and of his values. Kant sought also, as against Hume, to establish the validity of science. In the process of doing so, he also heightened the dialectical tension between nature and freedom. Indeed, a new set of expressions articulated this cultural motive. On the one hand, Science and faith were seen as the two irreconcilable worlds of nature, science, and freedom, faith. And, on the other, the revealing terminology that came into usage at the time saw it as a dualism of reality and value. As science came into increasing prominence, prestige, and power within the 20th century, this dualism worked more sharply to drive a wedge between nature, science, and reality on one hand, and freedom, faith, and value on the other. Kinsey has not been the only scientist to turn on freedom, faith, and value with all the dogged and determined scientism of the ancient cynics. This dialectic is basic to modern thought, as almost any textbook gives witness. Thus, so influential a text writer as Edwin Arthur Burt in his Principles and Problems of Right Thinking, a textbook for logic, reflective thinking and orientation courses, 1928, devoted a, cent a central chapter introductory to his concluding section to, quote, facts versus value, unquote, end quote. But this very statement of the dialectic is its breakdown. Religion, freedom, value, morality and law are seen as non-factual, implicitly subjective and as merely pragmatic or relativistic. As a result of this breakdown, crisis again grips the rest, already twice rescued by the entrance and revival of biblical faith. The reality which remains is either an atomistic and lawless particular particularity or the undifferentiated and meaningless oneness of matter or energy in motion in either instance host, in either in, in either instance hostile to value and to liberty section 4 the crisis the dilemma is a very real one and in terms of the cultural motive insuperable detached law because it is an expression of value from reality and law as unreal and subjective disappears, as law in, in the integral sense has disappeared under pragmatic, relativistic and histori historistic thinking. Attached law to reality as an aspect of matter or energy, it ceases to be a value and becomes a blind deterministic force hostile to man's liberty. 
Thus, liberty is dissolved either into myth or into license, and if license becomes anti-law in nature. In terms of the blind force of nature, liberty is no more than determinism and a myth. In terms of the world of value, liberty is again a myth. It has no reality or meaning because it is part of a, that unreal world. In terms of atomistic particularity, liberty is anti-law. In terms of the oneness of reality, it is a divisive separation from the wholeness of the unity of being. With the collapse of the dialectic comes mysticism or cynicism. Occultist and mystical books are the unacknowledged, because undignified, bestsellers of our day. Modern art and literature are extensively mystical, although not in the medieval sense. They are an openly pagan mysticism. They are dedicated to private and subjective worlds of meaning and are built on the hatred and flight from the material world and realism into the vast ocean of unconsciousness considered as true value. The extent of open cynicism in our culture is apparent in such works as Lawrence Lipton's The Holy Barbarians, 1959. Ginsburg's Howe was, at its trial, defended as religious and moral by university professors precisely because it denied all law and morality in favour of a new creed, the equal value, or non-value, and acceptability of all things. To this new gospel of cynicism, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer and other works are dedicated. Today also, as in the days of the Roman circus, marked interest is shown in another natural levelling phenomenon, bestiality and pornographic films showing trained dogs copulating with women are beginning to appear at smokers and special showings. When meaning is gone, and the exploration of reality in terms of fundamental meaning collapses, then the exploration of sensation takes its place. The process in the Greek text of Romans 127 is described by Paul as the burning out of man. <coughs> Section 5. The Libertarian Failure In the face of this, some libertarians have sought to revivify culture and re-establish liberty by returning to the 18th century formulation of the dialectic. Apart from the difficulty of giving life to a faulty and dying faith, this, this attempt is doomed to failure in that it fails to see the source of the cultural problem. By its limited, although important, concern, liberty, it overlooks the basic matter of faith and fails to recognise that the liberty it looks back to was a youthful accident of the humanistic dialectic of which statism is the essence. However, more perceptive libertarians have attempted to keep up with the times by recognising the death of values as such and seeking to somehow draw out a new kind of value from the world of science out of brute factuality. These libertarians attempt to extract from the great god nature by means of science in the form of tests, measurements or natural laws some results to prove that nature does permit liberty. Thus, much has been made of the physicist's discovery of the principle of indetermin indeterminacy, to cite one example, that is, the one most prominently used in this century. But scientific indeterminacy is not much more than chance variation. It is blind, impersonal and purposeless. Statistical probability is not liberty, Moreover, this procedure merely underscores the subservience of man and of man's illusory liberty to nature, a blind force or energy in motion. Furthermore, the essential point is missed, namely that modern man is not primarily interested in liberty and often is not interested in it at all. Above all else, as Doyerfield has stated it, modern man has lost himself and he cannot grieve greatly over other things when faced with this primary loss, and with the sense of the total collapse of all meaning. When man finds himself, to use a characteristic expression of Van Til, on the frightening and vast shore of undifferentiated being, he has no standard by which to value himself or anything else in all creation. Liberty is thus inevitably irrelevant. The average libertarian fails to see this problem because he is often unaware of his own position of relative wealth, 
having usually been reared in a Christian home. He lives on unearned increment and steadily lays waste his inherited capital, which he treats as a fact of nature rather than a past Christian victory. He assumes civilization, as Jose Ortega y Gasset said, the typical scientist does, whom he described in The Barbarism of Specialization, as believing, quote, that civilization is there in just the same way as the Earth's crust and the forest primeval, end quote. This fearful error is reinforced by the myth of evolution, which treats civilization as culture, civilization and culture as natural products of man's evolutionary development in the same basic sense as nest building is a part of the life of birds. Man's blindness is thus doubly insured. The libertarian contribution has been a splendid one in the narrow provinces of literary criticism and political and economic thought, but it has been oblivious to the larger issue. By avoiding the larger issue, it has been at times both marginal and parasitic. This is apparent in the hope of some libertarians for another Burke, that is, for a man reflecting Christian tradition without being fully a part of it. Its hunger has too often been for God without God. This hope was well expressed in the title of one book, John, Crow's Ran John Crow Ransom's God Without Thunder, An Unorthodox Defense of Orthodoxy, 1930. This purely sociolog sociological orthodoxy has its nemesis, since it is without true commitment. It is equally usable to justify statism, as notably in Machiavelli and Reinhold Niebuhr, and it still fails to answer the dialectical tension. Section 6. The Christian Answer As Van Til points out in Christology and Barthianism, quote, all non-biblical thought is dialectical, end quote, and all of it, quote, expresses itself in the form of a religious dualism, end quote. Moreover, as Van Til has pointed out in another context, all such thought is immanentistic, immanentistic and is dedicated to the principle of continuity. By its immanence philosophy, it insists that all power, purpose and meaning must be inherent in the world of nature so that it seeks to envelop God in his cosmos. By means of the principle of continuity, all things are reduced to a common being. Modern thought, whether Marxist or libertarian, is alike established on the Enlightenment's dialectic. This does not obscure the internal differences, but even as the nominalists and realists of scholasticism shared a common world and a common fate, so contemporary facets of the humanistic dialectic, however hostile, share a common destiny as the dialectical tension tears their world apart. No late medieval index or inquisition could stem the decay, neither can Soviet tyranny and suppression, which only testify to the abiding and gra growing collapse of the dialectic. The Soviet intellectual does not believe in the cultural motives he is expected to champion. The Christian cultural motive has been, although mainly peripheral, nonetheless the vitality of Western culture since the 5th century, when the Council of Chalcedon, facing a world in disintegration, boldly asserted the Christology, which is basic to true liberty. This motive has been descri described by Doyavird as the biblical theme of creation, fall into sin and redemption by Jesus Christ as the incarnate word of God in the communion of the Holy Spirit. End quote. According to Calvin, the ground and presupposition of self-knowledge is the knowledge of God. Accordingly, self-knowledge transcends the theoretical attitude of thought. This means that, because man is not self-created, and because the universe is not man's creation, man's knowledge of himself and his world must be governed by the prior interpretation of the Creator. Man's knowledge is thus not creative, but, in the Christian sense, analogical. To follow Van Til, whose formulation here is the decisive one, the Christian motive is basically that of the ontological trinity as revealed in Scripture. God is eternal, an uncreated being, and the universe is his creation and thus created being. It has meaning only in terms of him, since he is its creator and sustainer. This triune God 
is the eternal one and many, as distinct from the temporal one and many. Quote, in God, the one and the many are equally ultimate. Unity in God is no more fundamental than diversity, and diversity in God is no more fundamental than unity. The persons of the Trinity are mutually exhaustive of one another. The Son and the Spirit are ontologically on a par with the Father. End quote. Moreover, quote, it is only in the Christian doctrine of the triune God, as we are bound to believe, that we really have a concrete universal. In God's being, there are no particulars not related to the universal, and there is nothing universal that is not fully expressed in the particulars. It goes without saying that if we hold to the eternal one and many in the manner explained above, we must hold the temporal one and many to be created by God. And quoted later, if the creation doctrine is thus taken seriously, it follows that the various aspects of created reality must sustain such relations to one another as have been ordained between them by the Creator as superiors, inferiors or equals. All aspects being equally created, no one aspect of reality may be regarded as more ultimate than another." End quote. The whole body of Van Til's writings is given to the development of this concept of the ontological trinity and its philosophical implications. For our purposes, briefly stated, very important implications are clearly apparent. There is, in this position, no dialectical tension. Because of the trinity, the equal ultimacy of the one and the many, we are not faced with the insoluble Scylla and Charybdis of theoretical thought. We are not faced with a vast, undifferentiated and meaningless ocean of being which swallows up all things. Neither are we faced with an infinite and atomistic particularity in which the many are without contact with one another. There is no need for the cultural yawning between a destructive collectivism and an atomistic particularity. Both the one and the many are equally created and hence equally concrete and equally under the absolute law of the eternal one and many. Instead of a cultural tension, for example, between state and man, there is a cultural unity as both are undergirded and have meaning in terms of the fundamental law of God, which governs and delimits all things. Section 7. Law and Liberty A basic aspect of this meaning is law. Man's liberty is rooted and grounded in this law, as Sir Walter Scott, in terms of his Calvinistic heritage, saw when he opposed to the French Revolution's saw when he opposed to the French Revolution's liberty, fraternity and equality, as his own battle cry, written for the Scottish dragoons, liberty and laws. Because the fullness of man's meaning is discernible only in terms of his creator, and the creative purpose, it is impossible, if man is in harmony with God, for liberty and law to be in conflict. Even as a fish needs water to live in, because it is his environment or law sphere, and liberation into air would kill him, so man finds his true liberty in God's law, his environment. The law becomes a curse to apostate men, since it makes clear that his course apart from God's law sphere is death. But to the redeemed man, it is the environment of life. Man, created in the image of God, has a cultural mandate, that is, to exercise the implications of that image, to be God's king, priest and prophet, in, to and over all creation, subduing it, that is, bringing it under his dominion in knowledge, righteousness and holiness. The fall redeemed man's return to God and the development of his status under God and fallen man's developing apostasy. All these things and more are circumscribed by the eternal decree of God. They are a part of the permission and plan of God in order to further what Van Til calls epistemological self-consciousness, man's self-awareness of the ground of his knowledge and being and the full development of the implications of his regeneration or his apostasy. History, then, is the process whereby epistemological self-consciousness is brought to maturity. 
It has, therefore, a double maturation, as the parable of the tares and wheat makes clear, from Matthew thirteen twenty-four to 30 and 36 to 43. The maturation of both good and evil. Apostate man will become progressively more dialectical in his thinking, and more and more given to the absolutizing of the relative, and the deification of his autonomy and his theoretical thought. Redeemed man, redeemed man as God's visagerant living, in terms of the glorious liberty of the children of God, from Romans 8.21, will progressively develop the implications of his image in terms of his mandate to know and use creation in terms of the word of God. To subdue it as king under God, as Van Til has pointed out, man must interpret the creation as prophet under God and represent God as priest and dedicate the world to him. Man is, quote, like God, but always on a creaturely scale, end quote. He Quote, was a, organically related to the universe about him. That is, man was to be prophet, priest, and king under God in this created world. The vicissitudes of the world would depend upon the deeds of man. End quote. Christ, as very God and very man, was the true prophet, priest, and king, and man's federal head and representative, reinstating him into communion with God and into standing with God by his representative and vicarious atonement for man's violating of that law. Since, as Shalston saw clearly, the two natures were in him without commingling or confusion, the confusion of the divine and the human, which characterises non-Christian thought, was forestalled. This is the framework of liberty. Its biblical character has been the decisive factor in Western history, even though its nature has been only spasmodic, spasmodically apprehended. The Reformation set forth this motive, although Melanchthon quickly absorbed Lutheranism and Beza Calvinism into the older and newer dialectics without clear recognition of the full nature of the Christian motive. The churches of today are radically infected by either the dialectics of scholasticism or of pre- and post-Kantian humanism, by the presuppositions of the Enlightenment. At their very best, their witness is limited to soteriology in a fragmentary sense, and the broad cultural calling is bypassed by conservatism or associated with humanism and statism by religious liberalism. As a result of this failure and also of the general cultural failure, Van Riesen's comment is an apt description of our time. Quote, the disintegration of existence, that is, the dissolution of coherence in the, in, in the elements of existence, has reached an advanced stage for a great many people. End quote. Men who find life itself meaningless or worthless usually find little value in attempts to recall past liberties. Liberty belongs for them to a dead world of meaning. That true world of meaning must first be restored if liberty is to be given its rightful place and respect. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.